This is an RNZ podcast. Hello, I'm Simon Morris. Back in the possibly mythical golden age of movies, whenever you choose to set it, one notable thing was its attitude to audiences. The science of demographics was then in its infancy. The marketing boys knew the difference between movies aimed at kids and movies for grown-ups, and they had an inkling that women and men liked to see slightly different things on the big screen, but that was about it. Mostly, who did they aim their movies at? Everybody. Here at Capital Pictures, as you know, millions of people look to us for information and uplift and, yes, entertainment. And we're going to give it to them. And action. The idea of a specific target audience would have been ludicrous to old-school Hollywood. Targeting implies you only want some people going to your movie. What, are you nuts? Step right this way, folks. The show is about to begin. Right this way. Here we are. These days it's all about targeting, of course, but the science is still remarkably inexact. Who knows what people want to see anyway? I can tell you that the two biggest movies this week are Five Nights at Freddy's, a rare hit adaptation of a famous video game, and Taylor Swift's Gigantic Eras Tour, which has outgrossed every concert movie in history. We're about to go on a little adventure together, and that adventure is going to span 17 years of music... Why Freddie and Taylor should have done so much better than previous similar films is a mystery. But one thing's for sure, neither of them was aiming at a particularly general audience, if such a thing even exists anymore. What do they want? They want to make her like them. Baby! Tell me how to stop them. (laughs) It's too late. Well, this week we're in the middle of the movie's spring cleaning season when a bunch of films that have been cluttering up the cupboards for months need to be cleared out before the summer holidays. And they're a typically mixed bag, including a couple from here. We've got to get him home. Hey, buddy. I just wanted some quiet. Ah. <sighs> Loop Track comes from the number eight wire low budget school, while Bad Behaviour is star studded but arty, reflecting its auteur's pedigree. Alice Eglert is Dame Jane Campion's daughter. One thing they have in common seems to be more interested in making films than in finding an audience. Unlike the latest from cult director David Fincher, The Killer, made for Netflix, is aimed directly at his usual fan base. Breathe. Breathe. Calm. Prepare to be excited. But first, a biopic of one of France's most famous politicians, even if the rest of us may be rather less familiar with Simone Weil. Tu fais quoi? Je crée le brouillon de ma vie. Que nous le voulions ou non, que nous le sachions ou non, nous sommes responsables de ce qui nous unira demain. Simone, Woman of the Century, might be a poor translation of its original French title, Le Voyage du Siècle. It's not saying that distinguished politician Simone Weil was the most important woman of the last hundred years, but it does mean that her journey from Holocaust survivor to leading light in the European Union reflects the age, particularly in France. Comment définir la mémoire? And you soon discover that the former Simone Jacob found herself invariably on the right side of history. Born to a middle-class Jewish family, she had a charmed life with loving parents until the invasion by the Nazis in 1940 changed everything. Que nous le voulions ou non, que nous le sachions ou non, nous sommes responsables de ce qui nous unira demain. Simone. Her experience in the concentration camps where she lost half her family formed her political ideas. She became first a lawyer and then entered politics with the support of her husband, Antoine Vail. 
and like her namesakes, philosopher Simone de Beauvoir and actress Simone Signoret, Simone Vale led a feminist charge around the world. Nous sommes faits de ce qui nous a précédé. Vos papiers. Et pour partie, nous engageons l'avenir. Pourquoi il m'attaque comme ça Il ne supporte pas ce que tu représentes. Simone, Woman of the Century, was directed by Olivia Daan, who's made his name with biopics of famous women, Grace of Monaco and the Edith Piaf story La Vie en Rose. One thing all three films rely on is some familiarity with the story already – which is tough if you're not totally au fait with European politics of the 20th century. Comment ne pas être conscient de la nécessité de nous unir pour nous épauler les uns les autres et résister ainsi à tout retour du totalitarisme. Simone was a passion project for its star, distinguished actress Elsa Silberstein, and she's very good negotiating the politician's struggles over 30 years. The young Simone is played by rising star Rebecca Mardet. And the film covers Simone Vale's career battling a checklist of 20th century causes. L'espoir. Je félicite Madame Veil pour son élection. C'est dans l'Europe que je le place. Abortion rights, feminist issues, the rise of the new right, immigration and the struggles to build and maintain the EU. Simone Vale was passionately involved in all of these fights and was also there to see most of them won. L'Europe qui a surmonté la haine et la barbarie. Votre travail, Madame Veil. Ma vocation. Ce n'est pas un travail, c'est une vocation. Le FN veut mettre le bordel, il faut partir. Je reste. She was a tough cookie by all accounts, not least because whenever she was confronted by equally passionate reactionary opposition, her response was unarguable. I'm not afraid, she'd say to the baying hordes of the National Front, I've survived far worse than you. Vous ne me faites pas peur. Which, of course, she had. And just because we've seen the nightmare scenes of Auschwitz and Belsen so many times before doesn't minimise their horror. Simone and her sister managed to get through it, God knows how, and it's the most devastating part of the film. Il faut rester ensemble. Rien de nous séparer. Oh, bien, bien, bien. On n'est plus là-bas, Simone. On est revenu. Je suis fière de toi. Et maman serait fière de toi. Simone Weil's devotion to the cause of Europe, she became the president of the European Union in the early 80s, was, to paraphrase the French title, the voyage of her life. For her, the European idea was to counter hatred, stem barbarian forces around the world and provide a wall against totalitarianism. Now, these are very French concepts, not the ideas, perhaps, but how they're expressed. You will have to wade your way past quite a few clumsy captions on your way through, Simone, woman of the century. But it is worth it, if only for its passionate argument against Brexit and for European cooperation. After a quiet year for New Zealand movies, suddenly two at once, and both created by multi-hyphenates, starring, writing, directing, and in the case of Alice Englert's debut feature Bad Behaviour, helping compose the music too. Could you take a photo for me? Can you take a couple? I know that we're in a youth culture and I have currency. I'm scared it's all going to go away. You are enough. Alice plays Dylan, a stunt performer on a cheesy sci-fi film being shot in the middle of central Otago. She has a prickly relationship with Mother Lucy, played with all the stops out by Jennifer Connolly. I had to be told later that Lucy's a former child actor. It certainly doesn't come up in the movie. Right now she's off to something called a semi-silent retreat in deepest Oregon. Mom? I'm just calling because um, I'm going to be on a, a semi-silent retreat in the wilderness, so... Don't contact me, I guess. <sighs> okay. Love you. 
I now have several questions. Why Oregon? I mean, it looks very similar to central Otago to me anyway, so why not set it there? And what's a semi-silent retreat? Is it the same as the piano's elective mute? The silence will begin at 6pm following the welcome meeting. Meeting room? Yeah. Bridge, maze, and rooms are beyond. Ooh, and especially good. Room All nine. the same. Thanks. And getting back to why Oregon, there do seem to be an awful lot of Kiwis there, including a Samoan chap and a Scotney from Cousins and the omnipresent Tom Sainsbury, not to mention a Russian model called Dasha Nekrasova and the retreat's English guru Elon, played by Ben Wishaw. I invite us to be quiet. I encourage you not to smile at each other. No winking, no signing. No, breakfast is finished. Wishaw certainly classes up bad behaviour a bit, but it does beg another question. Are hippie retreats where you try and find yourself still a thing? You know, publicly beating yourself up about your traumas, role-playing yourselves as babies, missing out on breakfast if you happen to sleep in? Let the snogging begin. (laughs) No, 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 I'm joking. Is there anyone who's willing to share a shame? What's stopping you from being enlightened? Are you enlightened right now? Since we have no clue what Lucy actually does these days and what she wants out of this retreat, at least this time everyone keeps their clothes on, all we can do is follow her behaviour, which is pretty awful. She seems to have issues with her late mother, culminating in a violent tantrum when she blames everyone else for, well, everything. You are a toxic nightmare. Don't think, Lucy. Go into the anger. Now, we don't see much of this in the cunningly expert trailer for Bad Behaviour, but stuntwoman Dylan has her own rather vague issues, often linked to her own mother. Presumably, this is to indicate a consistent plot or theme. You know, mothers and daughters, what are you going to do? Never, ever give in to hope. Do you think I'm a bad mother? You're not a bad person. It's just bad behaviour. At the end, mother and daughter leave Oregon and central Otago and end up bonding in, why not, San Francisco, although it looks quite a lot like central Otago to me. Now, I only have one more question. When the considerable amount of New Zealand public money was spent on bad behaviour, stars like Ben Wishaw and Jennifer Connelly don't come cheap after all, did anyone ask who might want to see this? And if not, why not? Does anyone relate to this? may not be all that it seems. No more. Elon. Over the way, another New Zealand film betrays its rather more low-rent origins in the closing credits. There are lots of special thanks, so I have to assume that quite a lot of crowdfunding was involved in the making of Loop Track. I know you think I'm crazy. (laughs) But I'm telling you, there's something out there. (laughs) Did you see it? It killed him! (laughs) Not going to get me. Don't you worry. It's been several years in the making, I gather, from when stars Tom Sainsbury and Hayden J. Wheel won a long-ago 48 Hours film competition. In the interim, Hayden directed a low-budget feature with Tom called Dead, which looked like a blown-up version of a 48 Hours film, and now it's Tom's turn. He also stars in Loop Track playing miserable loser Ian on his first solo trip into the wild. It's your first time up here? Yeah. Yeah. I'm Nicky, by the way. Oh, that's me. Like Lucy in Bad Behaviour, Ian struggles to engage our support because, A, we've got no idea who he is and what he wants, he's clearly clueless about the great outdoors, and, B, he has no personality to speak of. But at least he isn't as annoying as Nicky, Hayden J. Wheel, who butts into Ian's life and then refuses to butt out of it. Hey, we made it! This is Monica. This is Austin. They're from Australia. Have we met before? I don't think so. 
They meet up with two other random strangers, Australian Monica, also rather annoying, and Zimbabwean Austin, slightly less annoying, possibly because he has less to do. Ian, are you all right? Yeah, why? You know, your whole vibe is just so... What's on your mind? Tom Sainsbury's remarkable career, his popular Snapchat clips lampooning politicians, his countless appearances in films and on TV, is almost entirely built on personal charm, I'm told. Everyone agrees he's a lovable guy. Do you ever feel like you're being watched? Or by the government? (sighs) Or something in the trees? Unlike the character he plays here, and for that matter, the script of Loop Track, which contains just about every New Zealand film cliche to date. Quirky cringe comedy, check. Cinema of unease, check. Man alone in the bush, the ever present possibility of cheapo special effects, check and check. Can you see that? I think it's been following us. Things can seem way bigger than they actually are. And sometimes they're not even there, maybe. In other words, the point was simply to make a film. Any film. The main attraction was getting out with some friends and a camera. And then go somewhere, somewhere cheap to avoid location fees or costumes or props or anything, and just do it. It is kind of creepy. I can see what you mean now. Don't say that. But a real film, one that people might pay actual money to see, is different from a fun 48 hours event. There has to be more to it than idiots get lost in the woods and look out behind you. Loop Track is too cheap to be much of a horror film and too dumb to be anything more than that. Again, who is it aiming at, if anyone? Nikki, this isn't the path. Yeah. It's obviously not the part. Feeling lost, mate? Just go straight. (sighs) David Finch's latest, The Killer, is based on a French graphic novel and seems right in Finch's normal wheelhouse. This is the man who directed films like Fight Club, Zodiac, Seven and the remake of The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. All cold, slightly callous with a hard-to-know lead character. I find music a useful distraction, a focused tool, keeps the inner voice from wandering. The Killer is not only exactly what it says on the packet, it's pretty much what it says in the two-word title. Michael Fassbender's unnamed lead character is an assassin for hire. You book him, you point at the target, he takes it from there. This is what it takes. My process is purely logistical. This job seems straightforward enough. Our anti-hero sets up opposite a rich man's mansion. The target comes home late with a dominatrix sex worker. It's David Fincher, what do you expect? And the killer waits for a clear shot. But this time, something goes wrong. The killer misses and has to make a quick getaway with bodyguards and police on his trail. Finch is very good at these scenes. He flees to his home in Central America. By the way, note the little in-jokes in his fake passports. His various names are all characters from old TV sitcoms. Sam Malone, Lou Grant, Felix Unger and Oscar Madison. Forbid empathy. Fight only the battle you're paid to fight. Chapter 1's climax is getting home to find his house trashed and his girlfriend badly beaten up. Someone is going to have to pay, and the rest of the film is devoted to just that. Ask yourself, what's in it for me? Stick to the players. Empathy, weakness, vulnerability. This is what it takes if you want to succeed. Simple. 
It's one of the great movie plots. It's certainly the most basic. Like John Wick before him and countless lone Avengers before that, the killer works his way up the ladder of blame. He takes out the humble taxi driver who drove the getaway car, various contractors and conspirators, all the time aiming at the final mastermind. If you want to succeed... And as the killer goes further up the food chain, the risks get bigger, the opposition gets more cunning, and the skills required get more complicated. There's a great little cameo from Tilda Swinton, essentially reprising her amoral executive character in Michael Clayton. For what it's worth, I would never have involved your female friend. So what's the appeal of a no-good-guys film like this? Well, first, there's always a market for a lethal weapon character using increasingly ingenious techniques to get what he needs. And the killer is a psychopath. The film is entirely taken from the point of view of someone with no interest in anyone but himself. If I'm effective, it's because of one simple fact. I don't give... Which makes you wonder why he's so invested in his female friend. Was she an anomaly, the one exception that disproves the rule? Or was he simply upset that his private life had been invaded? We never find out, and I doubt if David Fincher is even interested. Like John Wick's dog, it's just a way to get started. Hey. The killer is chilly, it's brutal, it's very violent. It's director David Fincher as gun for hire in many ways as he executes a hit with no muss, no fuss, and at the end, no sign he was ever there. One for fans of the perfect crime, in other words. Not quite a description of this week's show, I hope. I'm Simon Morris, and I hope you'll join me at the movies same time next week.